hard to talk about. Let me, let me see how I can do this fast. Because I don't want to get bogged down. If I look at my notes, I think I can do it fast. Okay? It is Wednesday afternoon, February 12th, 2020. Amazing. 2020. And we're asking the Lord to give us 2020 vision as we study in His Word. As a very quick review, because I have some new ones across there, I just want to bring you up real quickly. We won't go into all the detail, but we took it so well and in such depth. How many of you in here think you don't know Hebrew? Good. No hands went up. Because if I say Bereshit, Barak, Elohim, Shamayim, Ed, Abrex. I, I need to see it. I need to see it. But Eretz is the last word. What did I just say? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, we've been going through that study. We have seen that, that Genesis Bereshit is the beginning of much. I won't go through the whole list, but, but just obviously it's the beginning of our universe as we know it. Our atmosphere, our solar system as we know it, because we'll be talking about that today. That's why I pulled that out. The beginning of man. The beginning of marriage, the beginning of all kinds, everything that we think of, the beginning of the people that God was going to channel through and bring salvation to. The purpose of this is not to tell us how the heavens go, but how to go to heaven. We've seen scientific evidence that has just absolutely blown our minds to what a wonder of creation God has made, that the heavens literally cannot be measured, as scripture says. We went into scientific evidence that, uh, I don't see my papers in front of me, I don't hold on to those kind of statistics well, but, it, it, but trust me, get the CDs or listen prior if you go on YouTube and just stand in awe at our God and what he has created, what he has made just right for us and how he works in split-second timing for us also because he is beyond time zero. But we can find a time he has stepped in, into that time, and created for us. We saw that this is one of the most quoted books throughout the rest of the scripture. We also talked about how everything begins in Genesis, everything ends in Revelation, that this is like where all the trains go out, and Revelation is where all the trains come back in. So we're going to see a completeness in our study because we will take it and look where it is, even in Revelation. We talked about the historicity of it, how it's proven to be fact. And I love the way God does it, especially in the Hebrew. He doesn't make it this big fairy tale. It's not a fairy tale. But he doesn't give any room for argument either. He just simply states, in the beginning, God. God was here before, and God created. We saw in Barah, God the Father and God the Son created, because Barah has the Son creating, and Elohim has the Father creating. We saw the Spirit of God moves over the face of the earth, so we have our triunity, our triune God, our three in one, all in the act of creation. That's amazing in itself. And we saw that, that uh, anywhere where it does catch scientifically, it has never been proven wrong. In fact, to the contrary, most who have set out to prove the Bible wrong end up believing it. That's very interesting, isn't it? Okay, we talked a bit about the authors, and we won't go into the details there. We know Moshe, Moses gets credit, but we saw that there's a compilation because we know God revealed to Adam. How do we know about the beginning? Man wasn't there. <laughs> so we know that God gave divine revelation. That that is what he brought to man so that man can know. And why did he do that? Because if we don't know where it all came from, we don't know where we came from, then we don't have the opportunity to have that relationship with the God of creation. Remember in my Judaistic background, in Judaism we're taught the first meaning for Shabbat, for Sabbath, for that rest, is to stop and recognize the God of creation. God created the world in six days. We'll, we'll get through day three today, I believe. I, believe, I think, I hope. <laughs> Who knows with us? <laughs> but we know by fast forward, God created the world in six days, and on that seventh day, he rested. We know that he didn't rest because he was tired, but he rested in the sense that showed it was a complete work 
a perfect work, a finished work, and he was presenting it to us because right from creation, he has drawn us in and shown us how he wants an intimate relationship with us, that he created us for that purpose. So he called his people, gave them Shabbat to point, to stop, to think, to relinquish from all activities that keep our minds from being focused on the Lord and just spend the richness of the day with him. I challenge any of you, whether you are in a Jewish Christian, Masonic, whether Hebrew Christian, whatever way you want to phrase it, whether you're in that, or whether you are Gentile and in a Christian, I hate to say that because that's so misused, but a, a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church that's leading you in the way that I'm sharing this also, take that whole day. Don't give God an hour. Give him a day. Give him a day. You will be so refreshed. You will be so renewed. It's amazing what opens up when you spend time. You know, we need to sit at his feet. We need to allow him time to speak to our hearts. We have to get quiet. And if you're good at being quiet in two seconds, my hat's off to you. I've got a nap going on and coming at my mind that it takes me a little bit of time to silence all of that and really spend time with him. I encourage you to do that every day, but especially if you set aside a day a week, reward is wonderful. I'll just leave it at that. Moving on. Uh, let's see. We saw, I think I've gone through that. We saw... Um, this is where it gets into the, the history, which we'll go back through when we go into them. Um, I'm not going to go through the background because we have all our beginnings as we study it, as we move forward. I think all I need to bring out now is we've gone through Genesis 1-1. We saw the creation from the beginning. We saw that God created perfectly. We saw that God created completely. We even talked about how God spoke. It happened. How can you have something chaotic come out of the mouth of God? That's contrary to who our God is. God doesn't do things halfway. He doesn't do things imperfectly. Could he? Of course. He's God. <laughs> but does he? No. We see a perfection. We see a completion. We saw, as we read in Isaiah, Isaiah 45, 18, and we let Scripture help us interpret Scripture. We saw that there we were told that the earth was not created without form and void. So we went into, chapter, into verse 2 where it says, that the earth was without form and void, and we said, hey, NASA, we've got a problem. We've got a contradiction. We can say to all those people, oh, you were right, there's a contradiction in Scripture. And we left it there, right? Right? No. 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 <laughs> Anytime you think there's a contradiction in Scripture, you get deeper. You get into the meat of the word, and you will find the answer. As we got into the Hebrew, the Hebrew being the original language it was written in, we saw that it very clearly, and the Hebrew says it became without form and void. We talked about what happened then. Does Scripture give us any indication? We saw that there is indication that this originally was called Eden. We know that God put the garden in Eden, eastward in the garden. I'm saying it wrong, Genesis 2.8. Read it for yourself. But we saw that, that this whole, what we call earth today, probably was called Eden. We saw in Isaiah and in Ezekiel, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, that Satan had this as his kingdom, Satan. That Satan is the Hebrew. When he fell from the grace with God because pride was lifted up in him, I want to be the most high, I want to be worshipped, I want to be like God, I want to be God. That brought him down. It brought judgment on him. He's still the accuser of the believers to this day. He's still fighting to get his kingdom back, but he lost this kingdom. We saw that it went through a judgment. What was on the outside, beautiful. The, the gems and, and all the description was gorgeous. We know we find those things in the core of the earth today. We mine for those. How did they get from the outside to the inside? Well, if God brought a judgment, if God brought water over the face of the earth so that we have the waters needing to be divided. We need to be able to see the dry land. We begin to see in the, the next two chapters, we're going to see times when God created out of nothing, times when God made something come into our atmosphere in the way that it works with us today. We'll look at the differences in those actions even today and what we'll be studying as I get past the review. But 
we, we know God uses water as a judgment in Noah's day. So it's no strange thing to think that he could have used that type of judgment. And that that is what brought the earth to no form and no void, uh, no form and void. So that it's a recreation in essence, a restoration as God made it inhabitable for man. Then created man and put man in the garden eastward. I still can't say it right. Genesis 2.8, that's going to bother me. I want to say it right. Well, I'm looking it up. We know that I'm talking about Adam, who is made in the image of God. We'll go into depth of that when we get a little later in chapter uh, 1. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. There you go. Okay, he planted a garden eastward in Eden. We know God put Adam and Eve in the garden of Eden. So... We, that's where we get that it sounds like it was all called Eden originally. We saw that Satan went after Adam and Eve in that garden to get them to follow him instead of the one true and living God. He deceived Eve. He got Adam to fall willingly. God aligned the ate from the tree that they were not to eat from, and they were cast out of the garden, lest they eat from the tree of life and live forever in that condition. And I for one thank God that this ends. Amen. And forever is the perfect state that God had wanted. But we do see that God brought judgment on Adam and Eve when they failed the test that they were under. Why was this so important to Satan? Because Adam had been given this kingdom. Well, remember, it originally belonged to Satan, and he wanted it back. It's mine. I'm not going to let him have it, and I don't want him to have that relationship with God. I'm going to get in there, and I'm going to mess it all up. And that's what he's been trying to do ever since. And unfortunately, he's doing to a great degree. I'm not going to say a good job because it's not good. He's doing a bad job. But he's got people that are doing a bad job with him. Thankfully, again, this will come to an end. It is not the final chapter. We know that from our scriptures. But, in fact, I'll, I'll run you real fast to Revelation 5, where we have the grant deed to the earth being opened by the only one who owned it. That one who owned it was the one who looked like the lamb who had been slain, but was also the lion of the tribe of Judah. Judah. He looked as if he had been slain because he had been. He had given sacrificially his own blood to buy back Adam, Adam. And in that, where Adam represented the whole race, his blood buying back Adam was representative of the whole race. He took his perfect sinless blood, placed it on the mercy seat in heaven that the earth would have been patterned after, and opened up heaven for us to go eternally and live with the Lord forever because our sins are forgiven in the blood of Yeshua, the slain <coughs> lamb, who is now victor, is the lion of the tribe of Judah, who Amen. looked as if he'd been slain because he's not dead. We serve a risen Savior. Hallelujah. He is alive, and he is powerful, he is almighty, and this was all part of God's perfect plan. It wasn't a, oops, and it wasn't a, what am I going to do now, and how can I redeem? It was planned. God did not plan it for the angels who followed with Satan. He did not plan it for Satan, I believe, because they were in the very presence of God for who knows how long, seeing God in a way that we don't. And I think because of that, God had mercy toward us. He did not have toward the angels. I'm so thankful for that mercy. I'm so thankful that mercy is new every day. We'll move on from that. Now that we've set that background real well, that we looked at, now we're looking at this restoration because God is going to put man in this kingdom, but he's not going to put him in the kingdom while it's without form and while it's void. He's going to make it beautiful for them. He's going to make it inhabitable for them. And so we looked at, can I get to it? Okay. We looked at the darkness was over the surface of the deep, and I need to remind you today, especially if we get that far, what that darkness meant. When we have the darkness, and then we have, um, okay, and that, this is coming right into where we're going to move into today. We have the Spirit of God move over the face of the waters. We talked about it was hovering, Ugh. brooding. It's like mama bird over the nest for her babies and, and preparing for her babies and, and doing what they need. It was like what the Spirit of God was doing as he hovered over the face of the earth. We're going to see that the, the dry land is separated from 
the waters. We'll go into that in detail. But right now we're in the part that tells us that darkness was over the surface of the deep. We saw darkness as judgment. That's another reason why it indicates to us that it was the waters of judgment that came on the face of this earth. But God now is restoring, and he said in verse 3, and we started this last week, but this is where we will pick up today. So I hope I've done everything I need to in review. This is where um, we, we read then, and I lost it. Okay. Then God said, let there be light. Okay, so we have the darkness being a judgment. We see that uh, darkness is not, um, okay, it, it was an emblem that would reflect Satan in, in essence. We saw the angels that are kept under the waters of darkness until they will be judged. There are those who are so bad that God has reserved them there. Jude 6 and other places teach us about that. But we see now, that God's not leaving it there. His spirit is moving over the surface of the waters. And in verse 3, then we'll pick it up, I guess, I guess from there. I think I've covered it. With, first of all, God said. We stop right there and let that impact hit us. God said. Whatever God says, that's it. Like I say, the Hebrew is very simple sometimes. Very. Someone called it bald almost, but it just doesn't, it gives no room to argue whether God existed, it gives no room to argue how creation came about, it just simply states it as fact and it moves on. Well, God said that's the power of his spoken word. What is God's word? Well, that's what he said, yes, but when, when we look at the word in scripture, he just said, the word is Yeshua Jesus. Remember Yochanan John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning. Hmm. I think that's where we are. We're in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. Obviously, that doesn't mean that God had a book. There's something alive there. There's something connected with God from the beginning. We know before the beginning. Because we know even before the foundations of the world. God planned and Yeshua, Jesus, carried out our salvation because we were saved before the foundations of the world. For God so loved the world. Yeah, I sent you around a valentine today telling you God so loved the world. That was planned. That wasn't second thought. This shows us they were both there in the beginning. It shows that it is his word. As someone said, and I like this, it's not perfect, so you'll find a little loopholes, but overall, you know, nothing's going to represent our God perfectly. Nothing. But we said the Father is the source of all things, the Spirit is the energizer of all things, and the Son, or the Word, is the revealer of all things. And what better way to reveal to us than in the Word? So we get His Word in the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word is what God spoke. So, God spoke, and it came into being. And, where did I go? Okay, I guess that's my review. Pardon me. There we go. <laughs> I wish I could remember it all. I use notes because I can't remember it all. Pray for my brain. I'd love to have it expanded. I'd love to be able to keep it all. So, what did God say right in the beginning? He said, let there be light. Now, notice the phrasing. God doesn't say that he's creating light. He says, let there be light. See, the original creative act is not what's implied here. And we, we see that. Remember, we're going to look at differences. When something's created out of nothing, it's barah. And I'll bring that out. When it's made, it doesn't mean it was created out of nothing. He may have taken matter and created something. We have to look and understand if light and darkness are in day one, then, wait a minute, we get the sun, the moon, and the stars in day four. How did we get light and darkness? Are they in existence then? No, it doesn't seem to indicate it in that way, at least not in play with us. So here the idea is that the light was made to appear. It was made visible. It was something that was there that God's brought now into play, so to speak. This is what the light 
But Jesus absolutely is the light. <laughs> absolutely. So even as he was the word, he is also the light. And yes, it could easily be his light shining. The only problem is where we'll fall short again is his light dispels darkness. There can't be darkness. And yet there's still going to be darkness because God's setting into motion what we are going to come to know as evening and morning and day one and day two and, and so on. God speaking alone does create energy. His voice, his words, boom, it happens. It's set into motion. We know that. And because God is light, this energy would be light. We see that. Let's look at 1 John 1, 5. Because, again, I like scripture to interpret scripture. So we go all the way to 1 Yohanan, almost at the end of our Bibles. Oops, chapter, I went to the wrong chapter. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5, and we read, This is the message we've heard from him, and we announce it to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. So see, that's why his light can be coming into play, but there's something a little different here because we still have darkness, and we wouldn't have darkness if, if it was just, if, if the light of Yeshua was it entirely. I mean, he's, oh boy, it's so hard to say this. I hope you're understanding what I'm trying to convey. Because believe me, as I study to teach, I need a better scientific mind. <laughs> I need a better mind in the spirit to really be able to comprehend, especially when I try to, to grasp hold of some of the Hebrew meanings. But what I'm trying to get across to you is, yes, his light would have given light, but in some way then he had to withheld because his light would dispel the darkness. There could not be darkness. If Yeshua came into this room at midnight, you can't have it dark. It would dispel that darkness. His light always does that. Look with me at Revelation 21. Maybe this helps us understand it a little more as we look to our future. Revelation chapter 21, and we'll start with verse 23. Revelation 21, 23 is talking about uh, the new, um, the new of God's creation, the new Jerusalem, new Jewish land. We're going to see new heavens and a new earth. This is not our earth as it is today. That we're looking in verse 22 says, of course, that, that Yohanan John is giving this vision and he sees no temple. Now the temple is huge. The temple is where God's meeting with the people. The temple was very, very important. So to be seeing a new Jewish land, the headquarters of our God. And our headquarters for us with our God, and no temple there. What's he pointing out? Well, this next phrase told us the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. Obviously, by those names of God, we have God the Father, we have God the Son again. Always we're seeing the two of them paired. They are its temple. And then verse 23 because of that, the city has no need of a sun or moon to shine on it for the glory of God. The Shekhinah glory of God has illumined it. And its lamp, what lights it? The lamp. The lamp. We said it. Yeshua is the light. There's a song, Messianic song, I don't remember the name of it, it rang around in my head that talks about how the light came into the world and the light dispelled the darkness, that there is no darkness in the light of our Messiah. I think they took it right out of these scriptures that we're studying. Go to chapter 22. Chapter 22 Revelation. of Revelation. Just flip over one page, go to 22 and verse 5. You probably got there before I did. Tablets are slow. <laughs> and there will no longer be any night. They will have no, they will not have need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. I love it. It's not going to end. It's not going to change. It's not going to get ruined. I love the scripture that tells us that never a lie will enter again. Why does it say that? How did it start? It started with a lie for us to be where we are today. That's God's assurance. It's not going to start over again. We use the expression, history repeats itself. God says, uh-uh, no worries. Not this time, not any time, because we're beyond time now. Never 
will alive enter in. Never will forever end. Never. What do I see in that? No crap. <laughs> I got convicted of my attitude on that, Rowena. <laughs> you hear me say it all the time. I hate clocks. I'm watching the clock. I know I'll be in heaven when there is no clock. And the Lord said to me, I use that clock. That clock told you exactly when I'd be here for the first time. That clock set prophecy in motion. And you even say yourself, Rochelle, tick tock. God's clock. So I said, okay, Lord, I'm sorry. <laughs> I take the correction. <laughs> but I still hate the clock. <laughs> so I'm a work in progress. <laughs> so what we are seeing is God's perfect timing. He did not want what we have now. This was not his first choice. He gave Adam and Eve a beautiful environment and he walked with them. We're going to talk about that if we get that far. We probably won't today, but it will be very soon. We're going to get into those scriptures. That's what God wanted. That's what he desired, but he did not desire puppets. He did not, and I've said it so many times, he didn't want to pull a string to hear, I love you, I will obey you, I will take three steps, I will sit, I will talk. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I want a heart that wants me. I want a heart that loves me. We see that he lifts David up in Scripture, David, because David lived a sinless life. No, no, no. no. David has some great examples. He rocked the giant to sleep in the power of the rock, who is Yeshua. But... He also committed murder to cover up his sin of adultery with someone else's wife. And yet God said, he's got a heart for me. He's a man after my own heart. God looks past our imperfections, sees us in the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus, hallelujah, and says, I still want a relationship with you. Don't break it. Don't break it. When you do come to me, confess it. Let's clear the air. Let's get back on track. But he never stops his love. Hallelujah. And in that, I see in my favorite word, the ineffable God I have. For those of you who are new, I had to go look up in the dictionary when I read that word. What is ineffable? It means too big to be contained in a word or a phrase or a sentence. That's that's what we're seeing. And this magnanimous, ineffable God created, said, let there be light, and in some way brought his light into our world to bring us this light. I believe it must have been at this time in some way, and again, I am no scientist, and I'm just struggling to hold on to, to my Hebrew here, but it sounds to me like God sent what we now know as light waves that he brought something in motion that was bringing the light toward the earth now. So the best I can describe it is to say maybe this was when light waves came into effect in our world. As the earth rotated on its axis, those light waves would move in and out of the area where we would have a period of dark and a period of light, a period of dark and a period of light. It may be that's what's being referred to here, that that's what's now come into motion, because we do know that then that darkness would make it what we now call night, and the light would be what we now call day. And we do see that God calls it that. We're going to see that as soon as we get to it. Or did we already get to it? Have we? No, we haven't had it yet. It's coming. We've got to decide what day is. That's why we haven't had it yet. So we're going to take that in some way he's brought light into this world now. Oh, I'm in Revelation. No wonder it doesn't look right. <laughs> Go back with me to Genesis. And we're going to pick up in verse 4, I think. I think we've done 3 completely. We did. God spoke. God said it. And it happened. That's it. No argument, no wonder if, no, it gets knocked out, no. When God said, it's done, it's done, take it to the bank. God saw the light was good, okay? Um, what can we say? 
can God do anything not good? <laughs> no, it was good. This is something that he's telling us, he's showing us, and we're going to see again. We're, many times we're going to see a complete, a perfect act. I tipped my hand to that last week for those of you who were here when I was all excited over a new Hebrew word I got to understand. God saw the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. Okay, we've talked about that. I think that the, the light is being distinguished from the darkness. Our next verse helps us understand that because it says God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So to distinguish it from the darkness is why he gave it the name day. So that now he's going to call the light day, and now he's going to call the darkness night. Okay, we're still not into a sun, moon, and stars that are going to be regulating us. But we're seeing, in essence, a cycle. We're seeing God's perfect plan. We're seeing motion here. When he called the light day, the question immediately is asked, what is a day? Well, if we look in scripture, we'll see that the, the word day is used at least four different ways in scripture. The first one that I'll bring your attention to is that it's part of a solar day of 24 hours, which is light. Okay? We have light, we have day, we have a 24-hour period because when it's not light here, it's light somewhere else. The light didn't go away. The sun doesn't go to bed. It doesn't pull the covers over its head and we don't see anything anymore. It's still shining. We're just not in relation to that sun to see it. So we see... A period of time, if we want to go evenly, we can say 12, 12 hours day, 12 hours night, because we're accustomed to a 24-hour day. Let's look at scripture and see what I'm referring to. Go with me to Yohanan, to John chapter 11. There we go. Yohanan, John chapter 11, and we're going to look at verse 9. John 11, verse 9, Yeshua Jesus is speaking, and he's answering a question that came up uh, before him, and he said, are there not 12 hours in a day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world, but if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Now, obviously, he's bringing a symbolic meaning to the light there. We can see that there's something more to understand. But he's referring to a day having 12 hours. So we can look at a solar period of time, a solar day, according to John, and say that's one use for the word day in Scripture. Back up on your way, going back to, to Genesis. We're not going to get there for just a little bit. Stop off in Matthew, Matthew, you. And we're going to look at Matthew chapter 17, and we're going to look at the very first verse. Matthew 17 and verse 1. And right away, the first two words that I read are six days. Six days later, Yeshua Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. Okay? Six days. He's using a period of 24 hours. If I say to you in six days something's going to happen from today, but well, today is Wednesday, you would expect it to happen next Tuesday, you know, six days later. Or if I told you something happened six days ago, it would have happened last no, Thursday. Thursday. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. <laughs> you get my idea. If I'm off a day, I'm off a day. God's not I am. <laughs> but you get my point. We regulate time by that. We can meet on a certain day because we're we all deal with the same definition of day. And that's worldwide. You know, do you talk to your friends? We're talking to people in the Philippines that we're going to meet next Tuesday. We know they're going to meet us on Tuesday. Now, that's a very interesting point because, actually, because of the flight, they're going to meet us on Wednesday. Yeah, it takes yeah. over a day to travel. When we land in the Philippines, we're going to be meeting people at night, Wednesday night. But guess what for you all here? It's still Tuesday. That's a mind blower for me. But, <laughs> but we know everyone has that same period of time. We're just moving through it, you know. Hawaii's three hours behind us. Everybody else is ahead of us. Okay? So, over a hundred times in the uh, Tanakh, in the 
um, original covenant, I like to call it, rather than old, because old sounds antiquated, and that's not what we mean. So in the original, over 100 times, we see day referred to in a way that's a 24-hour period that we understand. When we understand how many days it rained, 40 days, 40 nights, that's 40 days and 40 nights. If we started marking, let's say from January 1, then we know it would go into February before that stopped. When it says it's 150 days before the water subsided, it was 150 days. That's roughly five months. 30, 60, 90, 120, 150. That's how I got that, okay? So we see that many times in scripture. Now we also see the word day setting something apart for a special purpose. The easiest and quickest to see is the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, that I've taught to you so many times now, I think that you can relate to that. That is a 24-hour period that is recognized. Our Jewish people who are in Judaism only will still, and I'm talking about the religious ones, will still fast for a 24-hour period. To be safe that they not desecrate their holy day, they'll actually fast 25 hours. That way they just got a little buffer on each side so they don't start too late or end too early. But they're dealing with a day. Where do we see that in scripture? Go back, on your way back to Genesis. Stop off at Leviticus, the, the third book, uh, by Akra in our Hebrew. Leviticus 23 and look at verse 27. Leviticus 23 and verse 27 is going to be very specific when this day is. Not only is it a 24-hour day, but it is a specific day on the calendar. Verse 27 says, On exactly the tenth day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall humble your souls and present an offering by fire to the Lord. And it goes on from there. So I can't pick a day on the calendar and say, hmm, I think I'll make the day of atonement March 17th. No, I have to go to the Jewish calendar, I have to go to the seventh month, I have to go to the tenth day. That is Yom Kippur. And again, all around the world will worship on what that calendar day is. So, there's a distinctive purpose for that day, it's a day set aside. We see the meaning in the scripture of that. Now, I'm about to complicate it for you. So, are you ready? <laughs> We'll also see that word day used for a longer period of time than a 24-hour day. So it stretches, and we're going to have to realize that. Um, let's look at 2 Peter, 2 Kepha, uh, close to the end of the New Covenant. And we're going to chapter 3. 2 Peter, chapter 3, and we'll look at verse 10. 2 Peter 3.10 is going to speak of a specific day that is not a 24-hour period, but is a period of time. Yet, it's going to be called a day. And I read 2 Peter, 2 Peter 3, verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intensity, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Well, if you were with me as we studied the book of Revelation... Did I tell you the day of the Lord was just when the Lord comes as that thief and heavens and earth pass away and the earth burns up and we've got a new heaven and a new earth? Is that all? No. When did the day of the Lord start? Tribulation. Very good. At the beginning of the tribulation. Tribulation is a seven-year period. After the tribulation is a thousand-year millennial period before we ever get to the loosing of Satan for God and Magog for the time that he goes through the earth to, to get all those who want to follow him to come up and dethrone God. Of course, he's annihilated. Well, not annihilated because he gets cast into hell forever, but he's stopped when he tries to do this. He does not accomplish it. And this is what we're referring to here at the very end when the heavens pass away. The elements are destroyed with this intense heat and the earth is burned up. Earth wasn't burned up before that. We had people living here on this earth for a thousand years with Messiah sitting on the throne. David's throne, David's throne, promised by the prophet Samuel, Shmuel, 2 Samuel chapter 7, approximately verse 16. Got to read the verses around it also. But when David is promised, he would have someone who comes from his line sit on that throne forever. And we know the promise is made of the Son of God. We know it's Yeshua. There's no room for doubt when you read those prophecies. All of that is in this day of the Lord. We're just looking at the end of it here with Peter. 
So this day of the Lord is huge. This long is a great period of time. Let me give you one more. Go back to John, Yohanan. And we really will get back to uh, Genesis. John chapter 8. I love this one. Verse 56. This one's going to take us back into our Genesis in our understanding that we're reading it by Yochanan. Thank you. John, who was alive in the days that Yeshua Jesus walked on this earth in human form. I think I forgot to tell people to silence cell phones because of the videotape. If you haven't, silence your cell phone because they'll keep going. Trust me. You don't want anything, so it'll never ring. That's the one that'll ring for. And I understand. John 8 and verse 56. This is Yeshua Jesus speaking. Now, because it's my God speaking, who speaks no lies, who only speaks truth, I take this to the bank. I have no doubt, and I refuse to listen to anyone who says anything different. He says, your father, speaking to the Jewish people, your father, Abraham, now, let me stop right there and say, for the Jewish mind, when it refers to our fathers, it doesn't mean that the one that gave you birth. My father might gave me birth, but my father is Abraham. Because he's my great, 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 great. Somewhere in there, i got to stop and say, Father. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Through those three lines, through Jacob's sons, and specifically through Judah, the name Jew comes, but through his 12 sons, we have the 12 tribes of Israel, which everyone who is Jewish is from one of those tribes today. I love the fact that you give science long enough, and they prove the Bible. Do you know what they say in DNA today? That they can prove, and I don't know how I don't understand, I don't get all the, the hat look, you know, all of that. <laughs> But they'll tell you that whoever has Jewish blood comes from one of four mamas. When I heard that, my little heart went, papa, papa, I know who the mamas are. <laughs> if you don't know, stay tuned. We're going to study it in Genesis. Because what we have is that Jacob had Leah and had Rachel. Rachel. <laughs> they each had a handmaid, Bilcha and Zilpah. And out of those four women come our 12 tribes. Their name, you know, which mama gave birth to which ones? Rachel only gave birth to Joseph and Benjamin, Joseph and Benjamin. We have 10 more that came out of the other three. But when science says, oh, they all come from four mamas, that's how far they got back. They got back to Jacob's day. Somehow in that DNA testing that they can understand, they're proving my Bible is accurate. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what tribe are you? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the only ones that know their tribe today are Levites or Cohen's. Cohen means priest, and Levi is a priestly trip, tribe. If you have that name, I'll get your question up for God. I'm sorry, I'll be right to you on in a moment. If you have that name, you can be pretty sure what tribe you're from. The rest, the records were destroyed completely in 70 AD. Because of that, no one can prove. There are a few exceptions of people who say, oh, well, it's been passed down in our family. Well, maybe it was, and maybe they're right, but they can give no proof. So, I know the tribe that my dad hoped he was from. I know what he liked to parallel with, and especially when Ruth, Ruth is brought into his life, which I told you about my mom's life parallels the book of Ruth. But do we have any proof now? because our name is not distinguishable in that way. Science has also shown that those with that name have a certain chromosome that is privy to that tribe. So I believe that there are markers for all of them. Maybe in time we'll know. Maybe in the tribulation they'll know, because we've got 144,000, 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes. But I guarantee you, whether Earth knows, God knows. And what blows my mind all the intermarriage, all even the intermarriage among Jewish people, God has in some way kept the lines so that he can draw out 12,000 out of each tribe. That just blows me away. But that's my God. He can do anything. Yeah. From it. You answered some of my questions, but <laughs> okay. when, when you said the Jews are from all 12 tribes, mm -hmm. it, 
the Jewish race ethnically from speaking comes out of the 12 tribes. The name Jew comes from the tribe of Judah, Judah. Right. the tribe of Judah. Right. But you have your 10 northern tribes go off into captivity, right. swallowed up by Assyria. Right. Later, you have Assyria swallowed up by Babylon, who swallowed up the two southern tribes, Benjamin and uh, Judah. 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 I knew Joseph was wrong. Thank you. <laughs> Benjamin and Judah. So when Babylon swallowed those two up, all 12 are brought back together again. And out of the, the 12 comes what is referred to by that point, probably especially because Judah was a strong tribe that God was raising up. The name Jew came off of Judah, and it stuck for all, all who were of Jewish descent from that time forward. Mm -hmm. That's why, in all honesty, for those of you who say, oh, I'm Jewish because Abraham's my father, well... Sorry, you'll get in chapter 26 anyway. Abraham wasn't Jewish. He was a Syrian. <laughs> because he came from the area called Syria. He came from Mesopotamia. He could be also called a Chaldean. But he can't be called a Jew because there was no Jew at that time. Isaac, Yitzhak, his son, he wasn't called a Jew. He was called an Israelite. That's who he was. Then you get to Jacob. And out of Jacob, with his son Judah, you get the name Jew that has become synonymous with all the 12 tribes now. So that's how the name came down. The ethnically, the, the blood that we call Jewish blood comes out of the 12 tribes. Is the 12 tribes from the sons of Jacob? I know yes. The, the Jacob. Sons okay, of Jacob. Jacob's one daddy, 12 sons. One daddy, 12 one, sons, and one, he had daughters one, too. We have Diamond oh, named, she's the only one named. But there are other daughters. Because they're two different moms, right? For actually, because you have Leah and Rachel, who were the actual wives, and then they gave their handmaids to Jacob also. When they were producing and they wanted to produce, then Rachel gave um, Bilhah, and Leah gave Zilpah. Yeah. Yeah. So they're, they're looked on... I, I'm concubines. I don't know how to put it, but they were, they were given to Jacob. He had relations with them. They bore some of the, the 12 sons. They were, they were privileged, in my opinion, to be part of that heritage and that line. Now, is that a superior line? No. no. Remember God said, I chose the Jew because, you know what? You're the runt. You're the least, the least likely. I'm going to get the glory. That's why he chose the Jew. So, it's no superiority. It just happens to be the order that God chose to take the message to the rest of the world. Because the Jew was given the privilege, but the responsibility to be the priest to the world. What's the priest to do? Represent God to the people and the people to God. That's what Israel was to do. When Israel did it, blessing came. When Israel dropped the ball, they suffer consequences for that. Does God ever say, I'm done? I've had it. Had my fill. I'm going to wipe them off. No, to the contrary. We're even going to study the sun, moon, and stars shortly, I hope. <laughs> and we're going to see God says, as long as there's a sun, moon, and stars, I won't make a full end of Israel. Anybody see that full moon this weekend? Yes. Wow. <laughs> wow. It was beautiful. Well, there's still a moon. That means there's still an Israel. That means God still has a plan for Israel. And when he's sending them off into captivity in Jeremiah's day, Jeremiah's day, he sends them all telling Jeremiah, buy a plot of land. Mm -hmm. Now, why are you going to buy land if you're going to go off into captivity? Isn't that a total waste? What's God saying through the prophet? Put it in a clay jar. Seal it. Guess what we found in clay jars? Our scriptures. Dead Sea Scrolls. Book of Isaiah in completeness and partials of everything else. It's amazing. Clay jars sealed and held and protected and kept. God was saying to your man, you're not going to come back. But down the line, they're going to come back. And here's their claim to this land. We have God saying that people are going to return. And if you doubt my words from that, go back a couple chapters, because that's chapter 32 where he tells you you're to buy the plot of land. Chapter 29, God says, I know the future I have for you. How many of you quote that verse for yourselves? Good, good. We can always draw a spiritual application. But who was it said to in contest? 
to Israel, to Israel who's going into captivity. I know the future for you, a future that's good, a future that has hope, a future that's going to go on. Where are they going to go? They're going to go into to prosperity. Thank you. They're going to go into captivity. That's a bright future. And God says, don't be so short-sighted. I can look past 70 years. They're going to suffer the captivity for 70 years because that's how many times, seven times the, the 70, that they did not, for 409 years, they did not allow the, the land to have its Sabbath. So he said, I'm going to give it to the land all once, all 70 times. And when 70 years ended, this is why I can't hit the clock, tick tock, God's clock, Daniel, Don, Don, that Daniel, Daniel, <laughs> is in captivity. He's been there since about 16 years of age. I heard David Jeremiah say this week he thinks he was 14. Okay, I'll give him two years. He's been there almost 70 years. He's reading Jeremiah. He's got a scroll, and he's reading the prophecy. And he's saying, hmm, by my calculations, if I was 16, and I'll use 16, I'm almost 86. Hmm, God, that's 70 years. Isn't it about time to get the show on the road? Aren't our people going to go back? And guess what starts happening? Tick tock, God's clock. If we think that was put into order at that time, we sit all the way back here to creation today. What an awesome, amazing God who can tick-tock a clock, use a people, a nation, to put his people into captivity, but say, i got a future for you. I'm going to look past the 70 years, and I'm going to raise you back up. I'm going to bring you back home. You're going to come back into the land. And do they? Read Ezra, read Nehemiah you'll see them come back into the land. This is a repeated cycle, unfortunately. Our people are back in the land today. Hallelujah. But are they worshiping God? Are they honoring God? Do they have a heart for God? Do they have a king whose heart is for God? Do they have those in there who have a love for God? Even Nehemiah has a love for God. I pray he comes to know his Messiah. They can really have that love for his God. But God says, that's Ezekiel 37. I'll write it down for you. I'll tell you that you're going to be back in this land, but your dry bones, there's no spirit in you because the spirit represents the spirit of God in us. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, he says, this is the comedy that's going to come on this land. We read and studied it in Revelation. It correlated. We went back and forth, and we saw this battle of Armageddon was the conclusion of it. But we see a period of time when there is much tribulation on that land that the Jews are back in. Do you know that means the tribulation could not happen before 1948? Because the nation wasn't in the land. It couldn't have happened until then. Tick tock. God's clock. It can happen today because they are back in the land. God has promised it and it will happen. And we know that we're coming closer and closer because we see the signs that are setting the stage. We get through 38 and 39. Hallelujah. Here comes Ezekiel chapter 40. And in Ezekiel chapter 40, we have the king return to the land. We have the, the, the temple set up. We have the beauty of the temple. Not because it was made with gold and silver and precious stones, but because the Shekinah, the glory of God, builds it. That's the millennial temple. That is not the third temple that will be built during the tribulation, that will be built by man, that will be desecrated by the Antichrist. There is nothing beautiful about that one. That's the one that comes in the millennial time. God has promised it will be so. God said it will happen. Okay, back on track. I get sidetracked. I'm sorry. I get passionate. <laughs> but... Um, I've told you we've got four uses of days now. So we have to take our days into the context. We have to look at it in its surroundings to understand. I'm going to prove to you in time that I believe our days to be the 24-hour day. I don't believe that this is periods of time like the day of the Lord, that it was a thousand years between God creating on the first day and on the second day and on the third day. There is that theory out there, but I'll show you as we go through from our Hebrew why I don't believe that to be. 
So let me start with that. Go back to Genesis, Genesis chapter 1. Go back to verse 5 that we're in. And in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 5, we read... Okay, we were in there. We called God called the light day, the darkness he called night. Here we go. And there was evening and there was morning one day. That's the way the New American <laughs> writes it. The evening and the morning is the point that I want to bring out. In the Hebrew, it's Arab and it's Boker or Boker. Boker, Boker is morning, Arab is evening. If you learn in your Hebrew how to say good morning to someone, you say Boker, Tom, good morning. If you want to say good night to someone, it's Lila Tov. He says good night. If you want to say good evening, you say Arab Tov. Arab. Evening, Boker, morning. In the evening and the morning were the first day, if you're in King James, were one day. What we have is a marker. We have something that we're going to be able to regulate by. We're going to see this marker come up again and again and again. And the evening and the morning was, and the evening and the morning was, and the evening and the morning was. We're going to see our God of order in this. Let me show you in Psalm to Helene, Psalm chapter 90. And if you don't get there, I'll read it for you. Psalm chapter 90. And we are looking at verse 6. And we read there. In the morning, it flourishes and sprouts anew. Toward evening, it fades and withers away. Okay? We're talking about on this earth. We can see and we can understand, even though we're pulling that one verse out and looking at it. I don't want to go into the context because it will allude to some other things. But we see and we know. We even say it. New mercies every morning. Fresh new start. You get a new day. You wake up with new opportunity. This is what it's being alluded to. By the evening, the day is fading away. We know it's gone. We know we can't get time back. That's why it's very important how we spend and how we use our time. Now, the Jewish people, oh, and, and that gives us the idea of a solar day again, the day, the night, the solar day, okay? Um, the Jewish people begin their 24-hour day with evening. We know that. We know that they start with the evening. Shabbat is sundown Friday, goes to sundown Saturday. When they can see three stars in the sky, they consider that it has ended and it's the start of a new day, even though it's evening. That's the way that they refer to it. Now, we've always thought and taught that, that, that they got that from this, the evening and the morning were the first day. And yes, that's true, but we're going to see a little bit more and a little bit different than that. I'm going to leave you on that until you have to come back to hear what I'm talking about. Because when we get to that point in the Hebrew, I'll show you what I'm referring to. But it is very interesting to notice that earth time for man began with darkness and then came the light. Okay, It started with the evening and then came the day. What a parallel for man's salvation. We start in the dark and we come to the light. I think we can see and draw that picture from this. Okay, Darkness, remember the judgment, light is the salvation. Uh, the darkness period, the light period, shows that the earth is rotating on an axis now. Because the rotation on the axis is what gives us day and night. It's not the elliptical, but on the, its axis. And this is one reason why I do believe that we're talking about a 24-hour period, not a long, like the day of the Lord, because we don't seem to see in here a period of time. We don't seem to see a geological age. We don't seem to see a separation. We seem to be being drawn to the fact this happened on the first day, this happened on the second day, this happened on the third day. And I'll just get my hand and get all the way to the end. When we get to the end and we have God rest, if it was like each day was a thousand years, then God would have rested for a thousand years. That would have been the first Shabbat. And if we have to pat on ourselves after God, then how on earth are we going to rest a thousand years? That's longer than my lifetime. I could never get up and work. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't even be born. <laughs> because my folks couldn't be doing anything. <laughs> so even by his example of his stopping and, and resting to give us that example and to have us set aside a, a portion of our week, it looks to be a specific 24-hour period of time. 
Okay, we'll keep building on that, just giving you the reasons that we see so far. Um, let me give you the proof as Shabbat. Go to Shemot, Exodus, and we will go to chapter 20 and look at verses 8 through 11. I do this because I don't want you ever to think I'm just saying this is my idea. I want you to see I draw this from Scripture. It's how I see and understand Scripture. So when we're talking about the Shabbat, Exodus chapter 20, Shemot chapter 20 gives us our regulations about Shabbat. It tells us, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Boom, commandment. God's telling us, remember the day to keep it holy. Then he says in verse 9, Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle, or your sojourner, that's visitors, Gentiles, who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now, in reading that, is there any room for the day to be the thousand years or greater? There isn't, is there? It sounds very clear, taking it at its face value. Work for six days, rest for a day. Work for six days, rest for a day. No one's to do any work in the examples given. God created the earth, the heavens and the earth in the six days, the sea and all that's in them. And he rested for that seventh day and blessed it and made it holy. Here's our stop. Here's our take that blessed day, that holy day, and spend it with the God who <coughs> created everything for us. So he rested on a Saturday, not Sunday. He rested on what would be called the Shabbat, the Sabbath, according to Jewish scripture, and we know that that's who he gave the Sabbath to, that would be Friday night to Saturday night, Sunday. Does that mean that you can't worship on Sunday? No. What does Shaol Paul say in the New Covenant? Pick a day. Honor me for that day. Set aside a day. He didn't get hung up on which day. We have a number of reasons why there are those the, well, let me just put it this way. The established Christian churches, and I use the word Christian in its literal, the ones who really do follow the Lord, often will pick that day believing that that's the day the Lord raised from the dead, and they want to honor and remember that, so they put that into motion. There's a whole lot of argument of how it got separated. There's a lot of sibling rivalry, rivalry between Judaism and early Christianity. There was a bumping of heads, there was a disagreement, there was, oh, if you're doing this, you're doing law, and you can't do law now because you're under grace. We can discuss this till the cows come home. <laughs> <laughs> if you follow the Gentile calendar, but if you follow the Jewish calendar, it gives good evidence that he raised before Sunday. He raised before Sunday morning. Yeah, according to the Jewish way of thinking, yes, because you have a different way of approaching the days. Now, I'll tell you, great scholars argue it. They're on each side. I will tell you that there are those who say that the Lord is crucified on a Wednesday, on a Thursday, and on a Friday. And they've all got good points. I know where I've kind of landed, but can I say 100% oh, dogmatically, I know that I know that I know? No. What I can say dogmatically, but I know that I know that I know, is that he raised from the dead. And I'm going to take a day and I'm going to honor my resurrected Lord. In my Jewishness, yeah, I will recognize Shabbat, but I don't recognize it in a way that I'm conformed to a lot and I can't pick up a stick and I can't drive to Shabbat, because I do. I get in my car and I can't. That's right there, I'm in trouble with the Orthodox because I've used the motor, I've used, you know, servant. They carry it to the point they should not even flip on the light because that light is their servants. They're not, their servants aren't to work, remember? So I am not keeping it in a law way that puts me under a heavy burden, but am I keeping it in a way that recognizes my Jewishness, my Shabbat, reminding me that my God created this earth, and the second reason given to my Shabbat according to the scripture comes out of Shmo, out of Exodus, when they came out of Egypt, then it's also given that meaning. So on that day, I'm to remember both. 
every Shabbat, I should stop and spend some time focusing my mind on the fact that this magnanimous God who created this entire universe and the glories that even have yet to be discovered is the same God who had his hand on my people that when they cried and moaned and groaned because they were being tortured and beaten and whipped and suffering and finally cried out to God, he in his mercy raised up Moshe, Moses, raised up a leader who he used to work on Pharaoh to let his people go. And as they came out and kept a ceremony that is so <coughs> precious, and we're coming soon to it, called Passover, in that I see one of the best pictures of my Messiah, the Lamb of God, that you could ever hope to see. And my people every year have had to keep that and look at that picture. And every Shabbat should be looking at that picture. What's God shouting? Messiah saves. Amen. Jesus Amen. saves. Amen. I want a relationship with you. I did it all. I sent the perfect Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. Remember when he came on the scene in ministry for the first time? Yochanan John said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Every Jewish mind should have gone, Lamb of God? Lamb of God? Okay, I, every Shaphat, I stop and think about that Lamb. I remember that Lamb being promised. But he doesn't look like a Lamb. He's not woolly all over, and he's not on all fours, and he's not going back, back. Why is Yochanan calling a man the Lamb of God? And then I watch it. Why? Oh, wow. The only one who could do these miracles has to be the one that comes from God. Nicodemus said that. Scared to be around his peers, went privately. You have to be from God because no one can do these miracles you're doing except they come from God. And he's introduced to the fact that he can become a new creation, a rebirth in the blood of the Lamb. We see all the fulfillment through Passover. Isaiah 53 jumps off the page. Psalm 22, 700 years before crucifixion is a mode of execution gives the picture so clearly that my beloved Jewish rabbis say, yeah, that's a picture of crucifixion. They don't want to say it's a picture of Yeshua's crucifixion because then they might have to believe that he's the Lamb of God that Isaiah 53 is telling about. But if he's not my dear beloved Jewish person, then who is? And if all our records were destroyed in 70 AD so that we cannot prove what tribe we're from, and Messiah had to show he was from the tribe of Judah. He had the right to the throne. He had to be of the lineage of David. He had to be able to show it. And he can show it. Well, he had to come by 70 AD. I'm sorry, but he can't come after 70 AD. So now, dear beloved, study history. Who came prior to 70 AD that fits the bill of the one who was promised? Well... There's only about 300 prophecies given in our scriptures to tell us what he'd look like, what he'd do, what he'd say, where he'd be born. Any of you choose where you're going to be born? Anybody got that power? <laughs> That's where he gets so excited. He was born where God said he'd be born. So now, my dear Jewish people, you're looking for the Lamb of God, born before 70 AD, had to be born where? Micah, Micah tells us, in Bethlehem, Bethlehem, in the house of bread. Is this the bread of life? Yeah, he had to be born in Bethlehem. Okay, well, let's look in our history prior to 70 AD. Who was born in Bethlehem that stands out on the scene? Well, we have one that they came from the east. And they said, where is the king of the Jews that's been born? We've come to worship him. Remember where Daniel lived? In the east. Who do you think taught them the gospel and the 
the stars. That Abraham's son believed that it was counted to him for righteousness, which is not that he's going to have a big family, because when does believing in you can have a big family make you righteous with God? <laughs> so we'll go through Genesis 15, 5, and 6 and just park there with me for a, a class because I get so excited that i got to give it to you in wooden color, even if you've heard it a hundred times before. I still thrill to it. It never gets old. It never gets old. And it gets deeper and it gets richer. It just gets brighter. And brighter. It does. It does. But here's that one that had to be born in Bethlehem. Okay, now I can go through 300 markers like that. I took you all through before this class in Genesis. I took you through eight prophecies. Just eight. And I said, what's the probability, scientifically, of one person filling eight prophecies? You remember it? One to seven power. That's more than eight. Eight was ten to the seventeenth power. But then, how many did I take you to? Um, the number escapes me. That's the ten to the 157th power. It was 30? Something like that. 37? Okay. Less than 40. And he fulfilled probably more than 40 in one day, the day of crucifixion. He fulfilled so many prophecies. But that possibility was so off the page of one person being able to do it, that if my Jewish people will honestly look at our prophets, what was foretold, look at it. Now, find me one prophecy, just one, that he didn't do, that referred to the first time, that's not referring to his second coming. But you show me just one prophecy of the first time that he did not fulfill, and I'll throw it all away. I'll say, you know what? You're right. It's all over. There's not one. He dotted every I. He crossed every T in our Hebrew. He, every jot and every tittle was fulfilled. Right down to the mode of execution, to the fact that they gambled for his robe, to the fact that they had the sign above him, king of the Jews, which the Jews were upset about and wanted to take him down, but God made it stay because he was king of the Jews. He is king of the Jews. And he will be king of the Jews. And he will reign on David's throne. Hallelujah. Okay, I got way off. Sorry. I hope it blessed you. It blessed me. Okay. <laughs> but here's what, what, this is what happens when you go to Shabbat. You get to just touch yourself in all of this. You get to just think about all of this. Do we study other scriptures? Of course we do. We study the whole word of God. It's all there for our benefit. But we should, if we're being blinked, kissed, we should spend some time in our minds on the creation and coming out of Egypt. And I can't come out of Egypt without Passover. I can't come out of Passover without seeing my Messiah. And if you want to see Messiah in the Passover, stay tuned. April 11th. I'll tell you more later. <laughs> Mark the calendar. I'll let the cat out of the bag. Go see. It's okay to go Saturday and Sunday. Oh, it is. Absolutely. We are a, the one new man. Ephesians 2 describes that very clearly. Jew and Gentile come on equal footing. I can bring you through the holy days. I won't do that now, but I can show you how the holy days themselves show the, the Gentile coming in on equal footing once Messiah has died and resurrected. That's Passover. It should go. It shows it. They are equal. They come together. The middle wall of partition that separated the Gentile from the Jewish court, it's gone. It's gone. And in one new man, we are worshiping the one true and living God, the God of Israel. We don't throw out the Jewish scriptures. We don't forget what you call the Old Testament. It is not old. It is not antiquated. It is not done with. It is not to be forgotten. It is your bud. It's your original. It's your beginning. Excuse me. You want the flower? You have to have the bud. What's the root? Yeshua, Jesus. Whether you're Jew or Gentile, Yeshua, Jesus. When Shaul Paul talks about the Gentiles being grafted into the tree, they're brought into one root, one tree. That's who we are. I love the fact I can have two legs. Let's call one Gentile. Let's call one Jew. Okay? Can they walk apart? Can they separate? Not unless you split this body in two and it doesn't survive. But can they walk together in unity and come together and worship one God, the same God? When you as a Gentile worship 
Jesus? That's who I'm worshiping, and I may choose to call him Jesus. I may choose to call him Yeshua. That's his name. That's his Hebrew name. I love to call him by his Hebrew name so my Jewish people can understand he's Jewish. How can believing in a Jewish God and believing in the Jewish Son of God, who fulfilled all of our Jewish scriptures, make you less Jewish? I don't get that. How do you stop what you're born? You can't. You are what you are. You complete your faith. You do not convert. You do not change. You do not turn your back on. Conversion is turning your back on something, going away from that, and immersing in something new. No, I complete it. I went full circle. I've got it all. And we get to share that together. So whether you're Jewish or Gentile, whether you come, Jesus or Yeshua, you're worshiping the one true and living God. You're worshiping the God from Bereshit to, hmm, what's our first four words in Revelation? The revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach. The revealing, the unveiling, the opening, the taking the blanket off, the taking the load off, the looking at who? The Lord Jesus from beginning to end. Every book in this Bible is about him. Every book. Pick me a book. You'll find him there. In some form, some name, some capacity that just keeps coloring our picture. But yes, go Saturday, get the Jewish flavor. Go Sunday, worship God. Just worship Him, people. Just spend time with Him. Get in His Word. Grow in the knowledge of your Lord, your Savior. We take a whole day to recognize the one we love on the calendar. Do you know He wrote us? Oh, love letter, and some people leave it on the shelf and never open it. How sad is that? If my lover's off and he's written me a letter, I guarantee you that's not going to stay folded up and closed. I'm going to open it up and I'm going to read it. I'm going to memorize it. I'm going to know it from start to finish. Well, you know what? I got a pee on brain, and this is a little bit much for me to get all memorized, but I'm working on it. <laughs> That's what we should do. Can Gentiles go to Shabbat? Yes. yes. Can Jewish people go to church? Yes. yes. You know what church was originally called? Ecclesia. Called out assembly. Congregation is another good word. The Jewish people hold on to that word because they don't call their place of worship a church. They call it synagogue or temple. They call it a congregation. It's a called out people. That's all that it is. The first ecclesia, they were all Jewish. They were the Talmudim, the disciples of Yeshua. The first one who went church planting, only I should say ecclesia planting, was a Jewish boy who went to the Jewish people in that area first to see if there were believers there. And if there were, he formed what you call the church around that Jewish nucleus. If there weren't enough, or if there were Gentiles that wanted it also, then it formed with both. Unfortunately, what's happened as time has moved on is the Gentile became so much more, what's the word of mine? There were more of them and less of the Jewish people, and the further that the Jewish people got pushed away from Jerusalem, from Jerusalem, from their center of study, of knowledge, and they didn't faithfully pass it down to their children like they should, you got a generation of Jewish people today who don't even know their own Jewish scriptures. So the Jewish flavor, little by little, dissipated. Was it gone? No. It's all over. You think, Paul, your 13 books that you follow that tell you how to walk your walk with the Lord today, you think he didn't draw from his Jewish background oh, yeah. to tell you how to have that relationship with his God, how to walk according to the ways of his God? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Pick me out apart, and I'll show you where it comes from, the root in, in the original. Yeah. He didn't walk away from it. He brought it together, and he welcomed everybody in because, remember, we've had Passover. We've had Shavuot. They can come together. So... Even if the church grew more with Gentiles who do outnumber us, because remember we're the rest, the least, the less likely, we still have the original there. 
when you're studying the scriptures, you're studying what was written by Jewish authors. You're studying Jewish law, even when you don't know it. Law is not a bad word. <laughs> Chaos is what you get when you don't have a law. What you're seeing is a release from the condemnation of the law. You are not condemned because you cannot keep the law. You have your salvation in Yeshua Jesus. But did he say, oh, okay, now it's okay. Go kill. Go steal. Covet. Do with your neighbor's wife. No. It's never okay to fall short of the holy standard of God, which is called the law. So it is one. We have one book, one story, his story, from beginning to end. That's what we have here. We also have, and I love to bring it up, one race. Thank you. Human race. Human race. God loves every one of his creation the same. And you know what amazes me? I'll be brutally honest. What amazes me the most is he loves me. Amen. Amen. Jerry old, rotten little, always messing up, <laughs> Rochelle, he loves me. He didn't love me because I'm Jewish. He loved me because he created me. Is there anyone in this world he didn't create? Is there anyone in this world who doesn't fit the definition for God so loved the world? Anybody escape that clause? Okay. I thought it was get back to Genesis. <laughs> Again, I hope it blesses you. Uh, we need to see the all. We need to see the whole. We need to understand it. We've got people who we admire long before the Jewish race starts. You've got people outside the Jewish race that we respect. We've got people in the Jewish race who we respect, and we learn from each. Genesis chapter 1, we didn't get far. Again, I hope it lays the foundation. It's good. Um, I'm watching that clock. I want to give us just a tiny bit more if I can figure out how to get. Okay, chapter 1. There we go. Verse, I think we're ready for verse 6. I think we've done 5 completely. Yes. Okay. I think we've, we've conquered what a day is. We're going to come back and visit that. Yes, Gary? Uh, you said there were four uses. Day. Yes. Yes. The first was the 24 hour day. Okay. The second was the special day. Third was the second time of the day. The Lord's day. What is the fourth? Is but, the um, no, the, the, the fourth first fourth is called the solar day, which is 24 hours. Right. Okay. okay. Then the second is, um, um, it still sounds like a 24 hour period, but it's where we see day and night. The special days. Like the Day of Atonement. Um, that's, that's our third, a day set apart, like Day of Atonement. So one and two are very hard to see separate. They sound like the same thing. One's referring to a 24-hour period. One's referring to two 12-hour periods that make up that one 24-hour period. Let me put it that way. Because so the, the solar will be the day, the solar day, the 12th during the day, and the other one is the 12th uh, and one the night. night. Right, right. That's your solar. 12 hours daylight, 12 hours night. And so when it talks about there being darkness on the face of the earth for a period of, of time, we see that division there, okay? But when we talk about just the day in general, we're talking about a solar day. A solar day is a 24-hour period. So we see, we see it talked about as just a day, a day being 24 hours. Then we see it talked about a day with light and a day with dark, 12-hour periods. Those two make up one whole. We have to do our, our fractions. We have to be good mathematicians now. Half plus half makes one whole. So it's still one day, but we see it in two parts. Then the third is the day set apart, like the Day of Atonement. And then the fourth is the longer period of time, like the Day of the Lord. That also is set apart in, in that way. It's for a purpose to accomplish something, but it lasts longer. Like Day of Atonement is literally 24 hours. Day of the Lord covers over a thousand years. Yeah, I'm not to get off the hand, but uh, I know I just recently learned how to say good night. 
How did you say that? Good morning. Good morning, Boker. Can you write? How do you spell Boker that? Tub. Sure. I, I know it's T O B. Mori is usually spelled Boker. Now, in Hebrew, you can exchange the B and the B. Okay, the B and the B sound alike in, in Hebrew. You will say the city of Hebron, H-E-B-R-O-N. You see that in scripture, you'll say Hebron. In Hebrew, we say Hebron. That you hear the V sound, but the B and the V is called Beit Veit. In, in um, Hebrew, it's the second letter of the alphabet, all of Beit, and I can draw it pretty well because it's pretty easy. The dot in there will make it a Veit instead of a Beit, but that's the only difference. And so those two are used often interchangeably. And you'll even hear me mix them because I try to help everybody understand. So I might say Hebron one day and say Hebron another day. Rarely do I say Hebron except when I'm talking to an English audience that I want to make sure you understand. So, Boker is morning. Okay, thank you. Okay, maybe I'll just draw one right here. Okay. Tov is good. <coughs> So we're going to use tov, we're going to say boker tov, and then when we want to say good evening, we'll use the same word, tov, but evening, literally evening is Arab, E-R-E-V, that means evening, and I would say I would use that word from maybe like 6 to 8, 5 to 7 when the light is, is less, but night if you want to say good night, like, like, like nighty-night, yeah. good night, <laughs> that, that is Lila, L-I-L-A, L -I -L -A. Yeah. this oh, night. Okay. Now, you can see those spelled differently also. I've even seen Lila spelled L-A-Y-L-A, yeah, but right. as soon as I put it up here, you're going to go, Layla. Yeah, that's <laughs> So that's why I choose to go phonetic on Lila. But remember, Hebrew doesn't have vowels, it has Continents, and then it has markings. Those markings tell you to go ah, ah, ooh, ah, you know, all the different sounds. So when you don't have the markings, it's so hard to know. And when you try to take it and put it into English, you've got to decide what vowels do I put in there. Well, look at our own English language. I can take EI in neighbor and in, you see, okay, she just took it the other way because. Neighbor sounds like A. Receive, it sounds like E. And yet you spell both E-I. N-E-I-G-H-B-O-R. And, no, oh, you said receive, but I'm doing believe. No, I can't do believe. i got to do receive because it's spelled the other way. Receive, okay? Now we have a long E. Here we have a long A. You're getting your phonics lesson now. <laughs> We've done science. We've done math. <laughs> Grammar. Yeah, we have it all. We're in school, are we not? So that's why even as we break our rules and make it hard to follow, we have to understand when you go from a Hebrew alphabet, that's alphabet, that has 22 letters, so all consonants, and they just have vowel markings, then we have to decide how to spell it. So you'll see variations that are slightly different. That's why also Hanukkah, they say, has 213 spellings. <laughs> I don't know that there are that many, but some double the N, some double the K, some double both, or one or the other. Then you have the C, the CH, like, you know. <laughs> I love to say, it, and it's true. If you've got three Jews, you've got four opinions. So, Boker <laughs> Tuck. I hear that waking up in the morning, my daddy waking me up for school, and I hear him, Boker Toe, Rachel, Boker Toe, and I knew it was good morning. And we often went to sleep. John Boy went to sleep with, good night, John Boy. <laughs> we went to sleep with Lila Toe. Good morning, good night. Good morning and good night. Morning, yes, because Hebrew puts it, yes, Hebrew puts it backward, but Hebrew came first. So, and if Spanish follows Hebrew more, then so Okay, yes, our Lou. Good afternoon. <laughs> 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 
word for it. I believe so, and I'll tell you why I think so. Wait for the minute in your kingdom. It's still not, it's just, I have to read it. I may have to tell you next time I see you, because I'd have to sit down and figure out my Hebrew. I don't know the word for afternoon. It showed me good morning. It showed me about for job. It's not showing me. Maybe they just go from morning to evening. Remember the scripture did. <laughs> There's an excuse. <laughs> okay. We will come back. When we come back, remember, we will come back. We'll talk about the expanse of the waters. We'll talk about the waters being moved and separating. I'm going to challenge you. Find out if you can from your English, is the dry land created or did the dry land exist? Is it made out of something? Was it already made? Can you tell from your English? If you can't, let's go look at it in Hebrew together and see what our Hebrew tells us because that is the original language it was written in. And I do believe God gave it because Hebrew does have more depth than English, so does Greek. That's why I believe God used those two languages mainly to give us our scriptures. Now, why do I think we'll speak Hebrew? And I wasn't thinking about the millennium, but there too. Of course, on earth, you're still going to have nations and tongues and, and all that. But why do I think it is the language in heaven? Because he told Jesus spoke Paul, spoke to Paul at the road. Paul knew Hebrew. Paul knew Greek. Paul knew probably Latin. He knew, you know, he was very studied and very knowledgeable. And when God wanted to get across to him, knocked him off his high horse, blinded him that he might open his ears to hear, he spoke to him in Hebrew. Yeah. Because that's the language of the Lord. I think so. I think so. Aramaic is um, the earlier Hebrew. It's an ancient Hebrew. It's an ancient, it's an ancient, ancient Hebrew. Hebrew, but it's an ancient Hebrew. Yes, yeah. so it has a bit of um, probably like Chaldean mixed in with it. It has, it's not... It's not 100% what we call Hebrew today, but it's the forerunner for it. But I heard that's what Jesus spoke. He did Aramaic. speak Aramaic, but I believe he also spoke Hebrew. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't believe it was just the Aramaic. You say Satan, you say Satan. Yes. yes. Okay. okay, that's the pronunciation. Yes, Val. Uh, you said earlier you asked him to get Hebrew. And I didn't raise my hand. I know absolutely nothing. You don't now. <laughs> you can say good morning. You can say good evening. You can say good night. You can read Genesis 1 1 because you were with me. You can read Bereshit, Barab, Elohim, Havashayim, that's the heavens, and our Ha the earth. The land. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's on the CD. Is it still on? The CD. Oh, yes, it's on the CD. Okay. Yes, it's on the CD. That's what if it was, then I believe I even brought it out. If I didn't, I'll put it up on the board. If you remind me the next time we come, I'll play Genesis 1 out in phonetic Hebrew. I'm not going to put it up in the Hebrew letters that I don't write pretty at all. And that you won't be able to read it all. It'll be just foreign to you. But I'll put it up in the phonetic English for you. Okay. Come on Saturday morning. We sing in Hebrew. Even my grandkids sing. Okay, so now it's Saturday morning. But if you like the Hebrew, stay with me. We'll take as much out of the Hebrew as we can. Am I a Hebrew scholar? No. I want you to understand that and to know. I have sources, I have resources, I do have a heritage, I was taught. Do I miss my dad who was a scholar in Hebrew? Yes. I can run to him with any question. I'm still missing that. <laughs> so, um, and Mr. Gill, does he speak Hebrew? Is he in Hebrew? No. no. I found Spanish. good afternoon. It's fluent Spanish, yes. And Italian, <coughs> and English, <coughs> and he's learning okay. Hebrew with me. Rochelle, I found good afternoon. It's oh. long. Achad, Zoharaim, Tobim. Okay, Tobim is plural. That's Tob. Oh, Achad, Zoharaim. Achad. T Z O H A 
R A I M. Akhar. Okay, that's a new word. I have to say it's a new word. After you. Okay. 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 Interesting. I've heard it. Interesting. Okay. We need to close in prayer because we are past time. Uh, questions the Navy answered before prayer? Okay, we can go on talking afterwards, but it's special for those who need to go. I covet your prayers. Please remember us in prayer. Please come back. Don't let the break throw you off track. I want to see it all. I love seeing each and every one of you. You're all precious to me. Even if you're new, you're precious to me. I have and Ron Daniel Ticker. We have the holdings with the goodies because we go back and that means I'm old too. <laughs> we have the new. It's a wonderful book. Bless. Just uh, give it to the Lord and thank him for this time together. Elohim Haith, our most high God, Adonai Yeshua, Lord Jesus, how we thank you for the privilege of learning from your word today, for going into the depth of the Hebrew to seem to understand the creation that you have made for us, and especially, most importantly, the relationship you want with us. And again, and again, and again, if I had a thousand tongues and spoke for a thousand years, there wouldn't be enough to thank you for salvation, to thank you for opening the way to heaven for us for giving us your word, for teaching us the way to go to heaven. Thank you that you put it right in the beginning. Thank you that you made it simple enough for a child to understand, and yet it can confound the, the most brilliant of minds because you, God, are an ineffable, awesome, amazing God, greater than your creation. Your mind, I'm speechless. But I thank you. You put on a face. You put on human form mm -hmm. that we could relate to you and that we know you know and you understand us. So, Lord God, mm -hmm. please be with each one in this class. As they go their way, may what they heard today lift their feet. May it bring them a little closer to you in relationship. May it ease their burden as they realize that God of creation is looking out for them. Yes. Loves them and is working in split second time. That you didn't just do it once when you entered this world and worked it to orchestrate it so that we would even know the very day of your triumphal entry, so that you would be crucified on the day that the lambs were being crucified, that you would fulfill every minute detail scripture. You didn't stop there, Lord. You're still working in time in that way today. You have your perfect timing, your perfect plan, and Lord God, we thank you. We praise you, and we thank you that you're willing to shepherd us and to love us. We thank you that your forgiveness is good past, present, and future, but Lord, we do, as you tell us, confess to you that our relationship can be reestablished when we break it, and we thank you that your love never ends. Lord, thank you. It's not just February 14th that you love us. You'll love us every day. Yes. 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 Praise you. Thank you. Hallelujah. In your precious name. Amen. Lord be with you. Go in his peace and his shalom. Thank you. Thank you.